There's power in this room. Whew, I can feel it. It's all over me. Mm, yes. Yeah, there's power. There's power. There's power. Y'all be careful. I'll turn this thing into a prayer meeting. Y'all. Mm, mm, mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Huh. God, we thank you for your glory. God, we give you glory in this place. Lord, pour out your spirit on us here this evening. God, we give you, lift up your name, God. We give you glory in this place, oh Lord. Your word says we're... Two or three are gathered in your name. There are you in the midst. God, we give you glory in this place because you are God that inhabits the praises of his people. Inhabit our praises in this place, oh God. Allow us to see your glory in this place. God, just as you revealed yourself to Isaiah in the form of glory, God, reveal yourself to us in this place in the form of glory. God, as the train of your robe, fill that temple. God, fill this temple. Lord, fill this temple. God, fill this temple. Lord, fill this temple. Fill me again, oh God. Baptize me anew, oh Lord. Give me fresh fire, oh Lord. God, we give you glory. We give you glory, God. Lord, just as you revealed yourself to Moses in the cleft of the rock, God, reveal your power to us. Reveal your power to us, oh God. God, we pray for the young children and the youth. God, we pray for them right now, not pray about them, but pray for them. God, touch them. Touch their lives, touch their minds, touch their hearts. Set them on a path to follow after you, oh God. That every step that they take be stepped towards righteousness and step towards glory. God, just as your word says, from glory to glory. In Jesus' name. Lord, we give you glory. We give you glory. We thank you in this place. Thank you for your mighty presence, oh God. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your baptism. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Won't you just lift your hands right there where you're at and start praying? I don't know what God's going to do tonight, but He's going to do it. God, we thank you. We give you glory in this place. You know, not every blessing you pour out, God, we return it in praise to you tonight. We return it in praise to you tonight. Give you glory. We give you glory. We praise your name, O oh Lord. Hallelujah. Touch every person here, O oh God. Touch every heart. Touch every soul. God, renew us. Refresh us. Restore us. Mm. God, pour out healing virtue from the throne room of heaven and touch everybody that needs healing in this place. God, reach out and touch in the name of Jesus that everybody be healed. Your word says that you bore, or bore your stripes for our healing. That by your stripes we are healed. And God, we claim the healing in Jesus' name. Lord, you didn't bore the stripes in vain, God. You did it for a purpose. Lord, heal us in the name of Jesus. Fulfill your promise, O oh God. Touch every financial situation in the name of Jesus. Lord, you said you would make us the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. You said we are blessed in the city and blessed in the field. God, bless, 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 bless. You said given it shall be given. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall you cause men to give unto our bosom. God, I pray that you pour out your blessing in Jesus' name. God, to every faithful tithe payer and offering giver in this place, pour out your blessing. In the name of Jesus. God, for those who have yet to begin giving their tithe and offering, I pray that you put a burden on their heart. Don't let them rob themselves of their blessing, oh God. Mm. God is about to do something in this place, church. Ah. Hmm. Yes, 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 yes. This is that. 
This is that. That's actually what I'm supposed to be talking about. My notes. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to talk about Holy Spirit baptism if I can ever get there. Hmm. I told God, I told God, I said, this is going to be a good time to to teach. And he said, yes, it is. Uh Uh-huh. Woo, he can teach more in 30 seconds than I can in a lifetime. If you can just let his Holy Spirit get on you. Jesus, Jesus. Uh, he's a teacher. He's a healer. Mm. Whew, he's a great physician. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Mm. And you know when God gets ready to do, to do something, he does it the way he wants to do it. And most of the time, it never looks like what you thought it was going to look like. But when he gets through, and you look back on it, and you say, it had to have been God. That's the way God likes to do things. When he turns around and does it, nobody else can take the credit for it. Hmm. Glory, 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 glory. Baptism of the Holy Ghost. We get something out of the way real quick. When I started studying the Word a few years back, before I ever went to Bible college, one of the first Bibles I owned was a King James study Bible. My grandma bought it for me for a birthday or Christmas, probably both. Birthday falls in November. I usually get birthday Christmas gifts, you know, they're one gift. And uh, she gave me this Bible, and so I studied out of the King James for, for many years. So let me just get it out of the way real quick. When I say Holy Ghost, it's because when I, when I first learned about the Holy Spirit, the King James called him the Holy Ghost. It's an old English word for spirit, so don't let it scare you. I'm not talking about something woo-woo. I'm, I'm talking about a real person, the third person in the Trinity, the, the third person of the Godhead, the person who's here amongst us today, the one who will reach out and touch you and feel you and baptize you. We're talking about the same thing. We just call it two different things. Amen? Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, the same thing. He is the same person. So don't let it bother you. I usually call him Holy Ghost. Him and I got real acquainted, and I always called him Holy Ghost, and he likes it, and so do I. (laughs) Uh, I'm going to give a quick general overview of the baptism of the Holy Spirit tonight. I, I know on Wednesday nights we do a lot of teaching and usually it's not very long, but I guarantee you you get into studying the baptism of the Holy Ghost and this thing could go on for weeks. I had to, I had to temper myself because I'd hit one point and my first point I'd just keep going and going and get myself plumb happy on the thing. I'd reel it back in. Otherwise y'all would be here all night. I, I told Keisha on the way here, I said, Six or seven pages of notes is probably enough for 15 minutes, don't you? (laughs) Hmm. The Holy Ghost is controversial because of this right here. Because a lot of people will come in and say, oh, they're just emotional experience and they're in there uh, just, just working themselves up. But there's real power in the atmosphere here. It's, uh, it's controversial, but the Pentecostal church was founded on the idea of Holy Ghost baptism. That's, that's where we got our start at. That's what separated us from everybody else. It, it's what gave us our identity as the Pentecostal church. And in the, in the last few years, it's, be, it's become uh, an afterthought almost. And the Pentecostal church is trying to be more politically correct uh, because for many years we've been called holy rollers and hanging from chandeliers and dancing and hooping and hollering. And uh, it bothers people. It bothers people. Uh, but if that's what it takes to be politically correct, I'll just have to be politically wrong. Because the Holy Ghost has got me through more mess and trouble and trial and tribulation. I couldn't do it without him. I couldn't walk this walk without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
If you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit here tonight, if it's okay, Pastor, we'll, we'll have a, a little bit of prayer time here at the end. I'll try not to keep you real long uh, because it's a gift that everybody can have. But I want you to understand it a little bit before we start praying because we get to pray and we scare people, you know. Didn't bother Peter and Paul and uh, didn't bother Stephen, all of them. It didn't bother Matthew and Mark and Luke. Didn't bother them that they scared people, you know. But I, I want to share this with you. And that way when you get down here, you kind of understand what's going on because I don't want you to be searching for the wrong thing. A lot of people, they get down here and search for tongues, but that's not what we're searching for. It's two different things. Tongues, baptism, and Holy, Holy Ghost is separate. But it's inseparable. It's two different things. Tongues is the evidence. Let me get into my notes before I mess it all up here. Whew, my God, my God. This is what happens when you get talking about the Holy Ghost. He's a teacher. He's a helper. He's power. And he'll get in there and, and take control of the whole thing. See, they thought they were just going to have a prayer meeting in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. And they, they come in here to praying and, and believing God for the promise. And they didn't even know what the promise was. But then the Holy Ghost come in and he rained down fire as cloven tongues that rested on each of their heads. And he blew in like a wind. And, and then he caused them all to speak with other tongues. And, and as the Spirit gave them utterance, and here they were, 120 people, and there's 3,000 people gathered around. Can you imagine the noise? I mean, it, if 3,000 people gathered in our parking lot and there was about 120 of us, how loud would you have to shout to get to the back person's attention? And here they were inside a room. And all 3,000 people gathered around outside and said, what is going on in there? Mm -hmm. That's what happens. The Holy Ghost gets involved and he'll magnify the thing and explode it. That's what revival really is. He'll get in that thing and magnify it and explode it. But that's why revival is dangerous for some churches because some things get in there and get magnified and exploded and they're trying to hide things and push things under the rug and when things get magnified and exploded, you either got to be clean and right or you got to be walking the other direction. God is going to come in and expose things and bring it to the light and once he brings it to the light, he can correct it and change it and use truth. You ever wrap up a wound and the air can't get to it? It'll fester up and get infected. You ever let that thing out and breathe? It'll heal up. There's some things people, are, maybe in this room, trying to hide and wrap up. And it's gotten festered. And any, anytime somebody comes poking around it, Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's folk like that. They, they, they say they want revival, but what they really want is thrills and chills because when revival comes around, God will start unwrapping that stuff and healing things and changing people and touching hearts and touching lives. Real change is difficult. Real transition is not easy. It's not easy, but when God gets in it, that's the only thing. That's the only option. Yeah. Mm. see the baptism of the Holy Ghost I try to stay on it Whew, there's power here baptism of the Holy Ghost he'll come in and shake the whole thing up that's, that's what the Pentecostal church that's what the assemblies of God was founded on in fact it's one of the uh, two of the fundamental truths we have two of them about the baptism of the Holy Ghost number seven number eight Baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is what uh, the, the fundamental truth number seven of the Assemblies of God says. All believers are entitled to and it should adirtly expect, expect and earnestly seek the promise of the Father and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. According to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, this was the normal experience of all early, the early Christian church. With it comes the endowment of power for life and service, the bestowment of gifts and their uses in the work of the ministry. Say of the ministry, that's important. This experience is distinct from and subsequent to the experience of the new birth. That's salvation. 
With the baptism in the Holy Spirit comes such experiences as an overflowing fullness of the Spirit, a deepened reverence for God, an intensified concentration to God, and dedication to His work, and a more active love for Christ, for His Word, and for the lost. That's the number seven, a fundamental truth of 16 in the Assemblies of God. Number eight says... It is the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is about tongues. Remember I said it's two different things, but they are inseparable. The reason they're inseparable is because it is the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of believers in the Holy Spirit is witnessed by the initial physical sign of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives them utterance. The speaking in tongues in this instance is the same in essence. Listen. Is the same in essence as the gift of tongues, but is different in purpose and in use. We'll break all that down. I'm going to give you a quick overview, like I said. We're not going to go into super deep detail here because we'd be here until tomorrow probably. And I don't want nobody falling asleep in the wind and falling out like he did on Paul, okay? Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Well, that might start revival, Pastor. We get somebody... (laughs) So we were founded on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's important even today. It's not something that we can brush to the side and brush off because it is what sets us apart from the rest of the denominations, the rest uh, uh, of all of Protestantism. Pentecostals believe that there is an experience called baptism in the Holy Spirit and we believe that that experience is something separate from salvation. We also believe that the evidence of that experience is speaking in tongues. The Holy There's a couple things I need to cover, though. Before we get to the evidence, I'll get there. But before we get to the evidence, there's something I need to cover. The Holy Spirit is already in every believer. A lot lot of people will look from the outside in on the Pentecostal denomination and our... our, uh, our emphasis on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they, they will sometimes say, well, they just believe that you don't get the Holy Spirit until you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that is not true at all. We believe that at salvation, the, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells in every believer. He lives on the inside of you. That's how you achieve change. That's how you are saved. That's why Paul said, once the old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. That happens because the Holy Spirit comes in on the inside of you and takes up residence. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Ghost. That's what that means. Not just after you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's at the point of salvation. That's when the Holy Spirit comes in and rests in you. But that is something different altogether than the baptism of the Holy Spirit. No Pentecostal scholar today would try to say that the Holy Spirit is not in those who have not yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In other words, he's in all believers. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25 through 27, it says, Of this church I was made a minister, this is Paul talking, according to the stewardship from God bestowed upon on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God that is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations but has now been manifested to his saints say manifested to his saints to whom God willed to make it known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is watch this Christ in you did you catch it Christ in In you, the hope of glory. He's in you. He's writing to believers, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, 12 and 13 and verse 15. If we love one another, watch this, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. The Holy Spirit is in you. I'll give you one more. Romans 8, chapter 11. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit, watch this, who dwells in you. He lives in you. He doesn't vacation there. Okay? 
doesn't sometimes come by and visit, doesn't come in knocking on the door, and maybe or maybe not he'll come in. You know, he doesn't drive by once a week, come see you on the weekends, especially on Sunday when you go to church. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't set up residence in the church and stay here and wait on you to get back for him. No, no, no. He dwells in you. So when you come in here, you bring him with you. Now, there is a special anointing on this house that every time I walk in here, I feel the presence of God. But he dwells in you. So you take him with him when you go, and you bring him with him when you come. He dwells in you. So we're not saying that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is the thing that causes the Spirit to come dwell in you. No, that's salvation. What we're saying is that there is another experience that when God comes in, He baptizes you in the Holy Ghost and and do you with power. And it is evidenced by speaking in tongues. In Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting and there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves and they rested on each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. was the first time this is that. That's what Peter stood up and preached on the day of Pentecost. He stood out and he looked back at what was happening to him. And, and if, you, if you go and study the passage that he quotes, it's in Joel. He said, this is, this is what the prophet Joel spoke about. But you know, Joel never mentioned tongues. No, no, no. He never mentioned tongues. But when the Holy Spirit came on Peter and he looked at what was happening, he said, this, this is that. Remember I told you that when God comes in and does something, it doesn't always look like what you thought it was going to look like? Y'all thought I was rambling, didn't you? I knew exactly where I was headed. (laughs) He come in and he'll do it and shake it up. What the disciples thought is that Jesus was going to come in and that the gift uh, that he was talking about was going to be when he comes back and takes over as a governmental power and he was going to take up residence on the earth and that he was going to take over and rule from an earthly kingdom and he was going to rule as a king in the physical realm. That's what they thought. And God got in there and shook them all up. And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. He poured out the Holy Spirit on them and made them ambassadors to the kingdom. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. I got to be careful. We'll be here all night. Mm. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. Now, Peter is out, and he's speaking to Gentiles. This is going to be the first recorded time that Gentiles are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Gentiles, that's you and me. That's anybody who's not Jewish. They were Gentiles. Because the Jewish people were God's chosen people, the Hebrews. The, the people who he delivered out of Egypt. They were God's chosen people. And, and God, through Jesus' sacrifice, opened up the whole thing to us so that we could come in and, and be grafted in as a branch to the true vine, which is Jesus, and become a part of his people. And this was proof to them. Very significant, this passage. It was proof to all those who were there, the, the disciples, the apostles now that they were. Uh, they, they still were not sure uh, that God didn't work through only Israel. And so this was proof to them that God had spread his his net further than the people of Israel and out into the Gentiles so that the whole world might be saved. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also for they were hearing them speak with tongues and exalting God. Notice the evidence. 
They were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Watch this. For they were hearing them speak in tongues and exalting God. So for them on this day, the proof that they needed, the proof that the, that the Gentiles were baptized in the Holy Ghost was speaking in tongues. In every instance throughout the entire New Testament, when believers are baptized in the Holy Spirit, tongues is either explicitly mentioned or strongly implied. There's not a single verse in the whole New Testament that you can point to and say, well, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and there not be some implication of the evidence of speaking in tongues. Not one. It is the physical evidence of the initial baptism of the Holy Spirit. What that means is the first time you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, the physical evidence... The thing that manifests on the outside, the thing that bubbles up from your spirit and comes out is tongues. The Bible says from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yeah. So when God baptizes you in the Holy Ghost, he's baptizing your heart in the Holy Ghost. From the overflow of the heart. So the overflow of the heart, when being baptized in the Holy Ghost, the mouth speaks. Can't explain it. It's a mystery. You ever, you ever had something and it was so good that you just didn't have words to describe it? Well, God is awesome because he gave us a language that we don't even have to understand to describe what's happening on the inside of us. It's an overflow of the heart, and we speak in a language that we do not know as the Spirit gives us utterance. Baptism, it's not tongues. Tongues is not baptisms. Please don't get me confused. There are two different things. Tongues is the evidence. Baptism is the event. Tongues is the evidence. Baptism is the event. One more time. Tongues is the evidence. Baptism is the event. I was writing a paper a few, a few weeks back. Most of you know I'm getting my master's degree in uh, divinity. And I was writing a paper, and it was about the evidence of speaking in tongues. I had to write, read a couple of books and, and write a review on them. And as I'm writing, I'm several pages in, and I'm reading all about the controversy and the division and, and everything. And, and people get so tripped up on the evidence I mean, there's, there have been whole church splits over the evidence. People kicked out of churches over the evidence. And as I was reading through that thing, it was like God just dropped in my spirit a phrase. And, and, and for those of you who, who talk to God a lot, you, you know God kind of talks to you in the way that you'll understand best. That's why he spoke in parables when he was here on the earth. Because he wanted to speak in a way that they could understand the kingdom of heaven is like right you remember him saying that the kingdom of heaven is like the kingdom of heaven is like so that it would be revealed to them in the in the right time and so God told me in the way that he talks to me he said you know everyone gets caught up in what the evidence is I think I told you this the other day when they should simply be concerned about the baptism Quit fighting about what the evidence is and go seek the baptism and you'll see the evidence. Amen. You're so worried about what might happen if you go in there and pray in the prayer room. I dare you to get in there and pray and just seek God and don't turn loose until something happens. I promise you if we come in here and you was dying of cancer and we start praying over you, it wouldn't matter if we're speaking in tongues or Chinese or Japanese or, or Korean. It wouldn't matter if we were speaking in Hebrew or English. It wouldn't matter what language we were speaking. If we were speaking in the angel's language, but if God come in and touch you, it wouldn't matter. You get so tripped up on terminology and What matters is the experience. What matters is getting in there and letting God take a hold of your heart and wrapping himself up in you. 
and wrapping yourself up in him. That's what baptism is. You've seen baptisms right up there in that, in that baptismal there. You ever seen anybody get baptized and come out dry? Mm -mm. <laughs> Boy, that's good, isn't it? When you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, if you come out dry, you didn't really get baptized in the Holy Ghost. That's why there's a lot of mean, well, a lot of folk out there speaking in tongues, worried about the evidence, and they think because they can spit out a few syllables that they're baptized in the Holy Ghost. It ain't the same, friend. Because when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, you come out dripping of his presence and dripping of the anointing and dripping of his spirit. And everywhere you walk, you leave footprints of his spirit. And you ever had somebody just come out of a, a cold body of water, run up and give you a hug? Makes it completely different if I walked up to you right now and gave you a hug, doesn't it? <laughs> Cause you to shift and move and... You ever get baptized in the Holy Ghost and sometimes all it'll take is a physical touch from somebody. Smith Wigglesworth was a man of faith and power that lived uh, several decades, a couple centuries ago. What was that? The 1700s, right? Smith Wigglesworth and, and he was riding on a train and uh, he's riding this train and he's over on his side of the train car and never said a word to the man who was riding with him. He sits over in silence. And the man, about halfway through the train ride, jumps up, grabs his newspaper and walks out and says, you convict me of my sins. And he walks out. Baptism of the Holy Ghost. You don't get that kind of anointing, that kind of power, that kind of, uh, how do you describe that? Atmosphere around you without the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's all over you when you get it. It drips off of you when you get it. Hmm. We need the baptism. It's power that God is offering. No one who truly loves God and is chasing after Him with all their hearts would refuse a gift that He has given, especially if it involves power to do... His will. So what is this baptism? We've discussed it's, it's not tongues. But it is what Jesus promised the disciples would come. In Luke chapter 14 verse 49 he says, And behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. In Acts chapter 1 verse 4, he says, Gathering together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they came, had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? Remember what I said. They thought that he was going to restore a physical kingdom here on the earth. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or epochs when the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And watch this, you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. There's a lot in that verse right there, so we'll unpack it for just a minute. The baptism is endowment of power. You will receive power, Holy Ghost and fire, power. Power for what? He follows it. Power. And you shall be my witnesses. Power, witnesses, power, witnesses. Don't let anybody tell you that he gives you the power to speak in tongues. That's not what this is for. Remember, tongues is just the evidence. What he gives you power for is witness. 
What he gives you power for is to spread the gospel. That's his whole goal anyway. Why would God send his only son down to the earth and have him crucified on a cross, come from eternity into carnality, to be torn apart, shredded, whipped, bore stripes, nails through his hands, nails through his feet, crown of thorns, and then raise him again three days later to give you thrills and chills and to be able to speak a language you don't know. That's not what it's for. From the very beginning, from the time that man fell in Genesis chapter 3, there was a plan. There was a plan from the time that they ate the fruit. There was a time, as soon as he come out of the garden, he clothed them with the, with the skin of a goat. And he tells them many things. And one of the things he tells them is he looks at the woman and he says, Your seed will crush the head of the serpent. And he tells the serpent uh, that, that his seed would, would bite at the heel of the woman. There was a plan from that moment. The Bible says that Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. There was a, there was a plan before God ever, said, ever looked into the darkness, the abyss that became the earth. Before the, he ever said, let there be light, there was a plan. And that plan was to bring the whole world to him. To give them an avenue through Jesus Christ to be, to be saved from their own sins. To be renewed from the inside out. To become a child of God again. That was the plan. Not so we can speak in tongues. No, the plan is so that all the world will know that he is God. And that he has provided a pathway to him. That's what it's for. That's what the baptism is for. Every gift that God gives is to lead people back to him. Mm -hmm. Edify self, edify church. You read about any gift, that's what they're for. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is no different. It's, it's to give us power to lead people to him. There are uh, denominations and, and people who believe that baptism is for sanctification. Uh, it is the power to live right. And I believe that. Hear me. However, the power to live right is not where it stops. The power to live right is so that your life can be an illustrated sermon to turn around and bring people back to him. The baptism of the Holy Spirit isn't given to you so that you can live right and not go to hell. You get that when you're, when you're saved, right? When you receive salvation, when the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells in you, that's when you get that. But the power that the Holy Spirit endues you with doesn't make sanctification possible. It drives you further into it. So that by be, being driven further into sanctification and becoming clean, you are a, a walking illustration of what God wants you to look like. From glory to glory, the Bible says. So it's not just that we can walk clean, but that our cleanliness can lead people to Him. In fact, if we look again at the seventh uh, fundamental truth of the Assemblies of God, it says that these things accompany baptism. An overflowing fullness of the Spirit, a deepened reverence for God, an intensified consecration to God and dedication to His work, and a more active love for Christ, for His Word, and for the lost. All of those things happen when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. They all accompany the baptism. And all of it adds up to being a witness. All of these things lead to one ultimate goal, spreading the gospel. He sent his son, Jesus, that all the world could come to him 
It's the greatest outreach event in history. This gift of baptism of the Holy Spirit is an endowment of power to share the gospel like never before. It's kind of like you're driving a car. I had an old boy tell me the other day that he had this car. He spouted off a bunch of numbers. I don't know nothing about cars. But he sure talked to me like I should know what he was talking about. You know one of them kind of guys? He was telling me all about it. And the only thing I heard out of the whole, whole thing he told me, he said, it's got nitrous on it. <laughs> like, I know what that means. I've watched Fast and Furious, okay? I know, right? That's kind of like what the baptism of the Holy Ghost does to the Christian walk. Because you're already in movement when you get saved. Don't let anybody ever tell you that salvation is stagnant. Salvation will keep you always moving, always transforming, always being renewed by the transforming of your mind, always headed to, from glory to glory. You're always going somewhere in God. He never leaves you in one place, always moving. What the baptism of the Holy Ghost will do is flip that nitrous button there. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's all right to have a little fun, isn't it? We are illustrated sermons. That's what we are. That's what our life is. That's what worship is all about. It's a whole nother sermon. But the baptism of the Holy Ghost enhances every part of your Christian walk. That's what it does. And it is evidenced by speaking in tongues. So a lot of people, they'll get up here and pray, and, and this is what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to come up here and, and pray like this. God, I'm here. Let me speak in tongues. Because it won't happen. Okay? He doesn't want you to seek tongues. That's not the way this works. In fact, if you ever find yourself seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost, God, I just want to speak in tongues. Oh, I want to speak in tongues. Take a step back. Check out your motivations. Because that's usually evidence that you're looking for something besides him. There's a lot of people who want to be in the ministry, and it's not because that's what God's called them to do, and it's not because that's what uh, their heart is for. It's because they want the power. They want the position. They want the authority. What I'm going to tell you is from the time that I got called into ministry, I've scrubbed more toilets and changed more ceiling tiles and changed more light bulbs. That's what ministry is about. I've seen more people in the hospital when I didn't want to go up there. I've prayed for more people sitting in the restaurant or in the mall. What do you do for a living? <laughs> Some days you don't feel like it. That's ministry. It's not, a, it's not always a joy ride. Same thing with the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, he's going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost in fire. He's going to allow you to speak in another language. Give you words that you do not know. He's going to guide you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He's going to cause you to be an illustrated sermon from here on out. But it's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to feel like, like you're on nitrous. But after tonight, you get baptized. Let's say you get baptized in the Holy Ghost tonight. And I'm praying that uh, all of you who are not baptized yet will come down here and allow us to pray with you. Because it's a free gift and God will give it. But I don't want you to think that when you leave here and you don't feel super spiritual when you walk out the door that something was fake because that's what the enemy will tell you. 
He'll tell you all oh, that wasn't real. It was just emotion, and you were just repeating what everybody was, was saying around you. And and by this time next week, you'd be thinking, hmm, I don't know if I want to go back to that church. They got me all caught up in that mess. And That's what the enemy will do. Get in there and whisper in your ear. But that's the best time. Point your finger in his face and say, oh, no. God did something in me. And he gave me a language that wasn't my own. He baptized my heart so that the overflow of my heart would become the words of my mouth. told you I wouldn't keep you long. I'm done. Is it a quick overview? We're going to pray for you. If I dove into every point that we talked about tonight, I could be here for a long time. And it's good stuff to study. If you need some materials to study, come find me. I've got some. We can help you out with that deal. You want to come to my house? We'll, we'll come up here. We can sit in one of these rooms and I'll study it out with you. Doesn't bother me a bit. That's ministry. But you need this thing. You got a basic understanding now, but you need this thing. We can study it out all the way to the end later, but you need this thing. You need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You need it. And I'm telling you, you need it because I need it. I need him. I need him every day of my life. I can always tell if I've gone a day or two days without engaging him. I come pretty hard to live with, don't I, Keisha? <laughs> Boy, you... me. Me without the Holy Ghost is not a good thing, okay? <laughs> she said, it's not fun. <laughs> this is a daily thing. It's a, it's a thing that you have to engage in all the time. You don't, some, days, some days you won't feel like it. Some days I don't feel like it. But by the time it's all said and done, if you'll get in there and just pray and allow Him to baptize you again. Baptize me again, oh God. It's not a one-time event that then it's over. Baptize me again, oh God. He'll come in and renew and refresh. The Bible says His mercies are new every morning. Baptize me again, oh God. Stand with me, please. Hallelujah. If I've been speaking tonight and you have felt a prick in your heart, whether you be here, online, watching at home, if I've been speaking and something has touched you, that's the Holy Ghost. He's speaking to hearts right now. Everybody who's under the sound of my voice, the God is speaking to your heart right now. He's either begging to take you deeper or begging you to allow him to baptize you. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, I want to pray for you tonight. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. That's, I'll call you out another night. Okay. We just want to pray for you because we want you to have the fullness of God. We don't want you to miss anything. This is the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I want you to have it. It's an awesome thing. 
So if I've been speaking to you and you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, I want you to come forward. And if you have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, I want you to come forward and I want you to form just an arch right here behind everybody who we're going to be praying for. And you can help us pray. I want you to pray. Uh, Brad, can you put something to play uh, back there? As this plays, you can come forward in your own time. We're not going to force you to be out there. But I don't want you to get out this door and get to your car and say, Man, I wish I'd have answered that altar call. Man, I wish I had what he was talking about. Because you can have it tonight. You can have it tonight. God will freely give it to you. He gave his son so that you could be saved. And he gives his spirit so that you can be excelled in your Christian walk. So you, you can have power to witness beyond anything you've ever experienced before. And he evidences by speaking in tongues.